Hey everyone, this is Tony, Dungeon Master of D&D Raw. And before we begin, I just wanted to say, if you enjoy D&D Raw, we would love it if you would support us on Patreon to hear new exclusive content and updates before anyone else. By contributing as little as $1 per month, patrons enable us to dedicate more time to creating episodes. Our higher level patrons get access to DMs notes, outtakes from our episodes, the chance to add an item or NPC to a D&D Raw episode, and even to join our monthly patron game. We wanted to thank all of our Adventure Tier and Above patrons for their support this month. So thank you Jeremy Kleinhans, Grimfuse, Fen the Goblin, a Linux fan, Feral Joe, and Dark Queasy, and a very special thanks to our producer tier patron, Gnome, for serving as a producer on this episode. To find out more about how you can join this list of outstanding people, go to patreon.com slash dndraw. If you're not able to support DND Raw on Patreon, we would love it if you leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Next week will be Rumble Squad Episode 16, and now, Serviceable Plots Episode 16, God Bombs. With me today are the following players. Hi, I'm Bethany, and I'll be playing Belinda Walsingham, the Half-Elf Awakened Mystic. Hi, I'm Adam, and I will be playing Akiba Khonshu, the Shadar Kai Hexblade Warlock. Hi, I'm Mike, and I'll be playing Scrib Whitecliff, the Human Mastermind Rogue. Hi, I'm Giuseppe, and I'll be playing Valen Blackwater, an Azimar Monk Paladin. Last time, theological and philosophical discussions filled the night and following morning. As the party discussed what had happened recently, Akiva, meanwhile, had a discussion with Umbra, and though not hostile, the Shadarkai was informed as to the full extent of what it meant when he made a deal with Umbra for his power. Belinda learned of Umbra's memory manipulation, and that he was well aware of whatever Akiva knew. Afterwards, the party discussed what their next move would be, and decided to go and speak with Jack before making any additional plans to leave Veripol. So, you head off to the jail, which is near the town hall, are allowed in, one of the main reasons being because they know you, Scriv, and you're escorted to where you find Jack kind of just standing outside the cell of faithfulness. Belinda, son, and he nods to the rest of you, it's good to see you up and awake. Son, you're looking much better today. Thank you, Dad. Look to be busy. I've been conversing with our prisoner here. Anything? She seems to be a essentially a peon to the Whispered Ones. She has almost no sway. It's more like she was hired by them. She seemed awfully confident before. She's a true believer. That's not good. No. She doesn't even seem to know all that the Whispered Ones want to do. She just believes in their cause. Did she say what she wanted to do after she got into the ruin? I did learn enough that she was to collect anything there, eliminate anything that got in her way, and then deliver anything she found to a cave a couple days west of here. Was she supposed to meet someone, or was it a dead drop? Seems like it was a dead drop. You guys hear in your heads, I'm here too, by the way. Morning. Just hanging around, nearby, out of sight. Not in the vague direction. Good morning. I guess the timetable for the dead drop has already passed. No, it's only been a day. She would have traveled out from here. Most likely they would have picked it up in three or four days' time, if there was anything. If there are any complications, most likely they would have gotten another check, or they have someone watching the spot. What do we want to do with this? Did you want us to go out and stake out the place? We have our own mission, but these Whispered Ones seem like a big deal. Jack, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I recall, the Whispered Ones had sort of a, a cell structure for their organization, where everything's very self-contained? Yes. What little we have mostly comes from Thoven and a small group that he had with him. A woman by the name of Saria kind of led the charge against this. Yeah, I do recall that name. It seems like this uh, faithfulness then is working in relative isolation and we have an opportunity to maybe learn more about who she's reporting to. That's mainly what I was thinking. I wouldn't ask this of you, but if you were able, if you could stop by this cave and at least check it out. It is along the road to Orenthal. Well, we could also leave something and then track it. He looks at you for a second, pausing. Yes, I suppose you could, couldn't you? I could. My only concern would be making sure that Zolas gets to Orenthal. That's why I wouldn't ask this of you if you feel that getting Zolas to Orenthal would be compromised by checking this cave out. I wouldn't ask you to put yourself in any sort of dangerous situation. It is simply along the road to Orenthal, which is the only reason I ask at all. My only concern is pursuing it. If Belinda comes through and we're able to track 
whoever does the pickup, then that would take us off the road, probably. Who knows how far we would have to follow them. If I recall, the Whispered Ones focus primarily on destabilizing in order to seize power. From what I recall, they have this cell structure in order to perform different experiments for different purposes. A lot of this had to do with, well, at least back in the time right after the cataclysm, creating some sort of perfect physical entity. There were other experiments that they conducted throughout the land. Most of their places were destroyed, most of their outposts, but it is almost impossible to tell if they've been completely wiped out in any way as they are so separated from one another. This could lead us to one of their outposts. Perfect physical entity. It was a result of an experiment from almost a century and a half ago. So if I recall, Jack, they were really after power, right? It was an attempted coup of Orenthal. They tried to cause distraction in order to seize power. It was thwarted, but it seems that they are constantly looking for ways to obtain power in some manner. I don't like the timing of this uh, resurgence. Neither do I. This could be a minor issue, but I do not like the fact that this is coinciding with everything else that has been happening. The good news is I don't think they knew what could be found or they would have sent someone more capable because let's be honest, faithfulness is not a trained agent. She's just the worst. Well, in addition to being a terrible person, she also seems to be unstable. This seems more like it was a a scouting mission. They did not know what would be here, nor did they think that it might necessarily be something of value. Clearly, whatever they believed was here must, must have been something that was a minor issue to them, so they sent someone who would be low risk if they were captured or eliminated in any way. That forgery was high quality, though. That means that either they have someone who's very skilled on their side, or they invested some amount of money to get them in here. Again, from old research, they tend to use every method at their disposal in order to acquire what they need. I wouldn't be surprised if they have a skilled forger on their payroll. Neither would I. And I wouldn't be surprised if such a person was an Orenthal. Then it sounds like we're going to go stop by this cave, and if we're lucky, they run all the way back to Orenthal, and we can just follow them into the large city. It seems like, in case we are not successful in tracking them, I think we should leave something that would indicate that Faithfulness was successful on her mission, but something that is so uninteresting and valueless as to be not attracting them to return to Veripol again. And what are your thoughts? I don't know. I'm not really an artifacts person. What would be something we could provide that would be a good stand-in? Eye of Adar? Yes? This crystal was kind of strewn all over the place. I managed to piece most of it together, and I pull out the small shard from my pocket. What's its value? Like, what was this? Was it something mundane? Something magic? Magic, I think? Uh, I can't remember. So you don't know if we can make another one? I, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's okay. Thank you for trying, though. Tony, I wouldn't have any way of accessing that memory, I'm assuming. Because that's a deity connection memory. That is a deity connection Okay, memory. just want to make sure I'm not overlooking it. Could we create or acquire a facsimile? We're in Veracol. No doubt there's probably a glass crafter. I can ask around. Maybe that would be a suitable substitute, just in case they had some idea of what they might find. Is it magical? I mean, we have it, and if it's inert... Yeah, but it's shattered. It'd probably be more attractive if we left, like, a actual completed crystal, in air quotes. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. It would still be inert, though. Put a crack along it. Give them a completed crystal, but make a crack. That way, if they're expecting it to have magical powers, it will show that this is not. The crack would at least make an assumption that it has been damaged beyond their ability to repair. Yeah, and then there are plenty of street-level arcanists that I can go up to and pay a script and have them just enchant it so it is magical, but not have it do anything in particular. I think that would be good. And the other thing I think we could do is return the letter that Faithfulness has. That way, they don't feel a need to look for her to contain what she has or knows. That's a good idea. That way, there's no proof that they would know about on her person. We just don't want them coming back here. We have to assume that they're having somebody watch the city for her. Not necessarily. They might be waiting to watch the drop, so if you do go to the cave, keep an eye out. Well, okay then. The Whisper Ones tend to be focused on small groups. They don't tend to be large groups, so they might not have a person necessarily, you know, able to watch everything at all times. More likely, they have someone that they can trust stationed near the drop site, or they will be coming to check it out soon. 
It makes sense they would maximize their resources and not invest time in things that aren't going to pay off for them. If they send someone like Faithfulness, that means that they don't expect to find much here, if anything. Yeah, she's not a quality candidate for an extraction. So, do you think there's anything else that could be learned by talking to her? Because I trust, Jack, you've exhausted all options. I've done what I can, but it's entirely possible you may learn more than I can. I don't believe that there is much more she'd be able to tell us, but you're welcome to try. You say she's low level. If it were my organization, I wouldn't trust her with anything, not with her temperament. I agree. I think we've gotten what we need. We have the letter. The question will be, what are you going to do with her? I had not yet decided. She'll remain imprisoned until we figure out what our next move will be. I don't want to be sending her to Orenthal for trial or anything along those lines while there is still the belief that she may return something for the Whispered Ones, so I can keep her here for now. I think that would be the best plan. Thank you for investigating this. I guess all that's left of our business here is to create the forged relic and then say our good- I would like to talk to the Eye of Adar, but we could summarize. Okay. I'm not really looking for information. I'm mostly just providing reassurance that everything will be okay. Okay. Don't worry. Adar's not gone. I'm looking for answers. We will get him back. That sort of thing. The Eye kind of commiserates that clearly, like, no, Adar can't be gone. Like, there's no belief in the Eye's thoughts that Adar could be gone. And I say a quick prayer to Adar with the eye, just to reach out to Adar to see if there's any answer. Was there anything else we need to do here? Are we going to create a forgery? Okay. So you guys are going to get a fake relic and have one crafted. Uh, Is there anything else you guys would like to do? I would like to have a dinner with the Silverbloom family before I leave. Okay. Are we planning to leave in the morning? I don't know how long making a fake relic takes. We'll speed that up a little bit and uh, they'll tell you he could have it done by the end of the day. Okay, so it makes sense that we would leave in the morning. And that would still leave us on track to to make the the drop as far as we can tell. Yeah. Okay, then we have the day. So, Scriv, you're going to have dinner at some point with the Silver Blooms? In the evening, after I make the uh, fake relic. Right. Is there anything else the rest of you would like to do? I mean, at some point I would like to talk to Jack again, just as a kind of a wrap up. Okay. I'm good. We just sort of go, I guess, and see the town. Okay. I mean, Belinda's been here a few times, so I can, you know, I can show you around. So, Scriv, in the evening, then, what about the rest of your party as you go and have dinner with the Silver Blooms? I recommend a restaurant in the area that is run by some local halflings that serve local fare. I wanted to stay at Scriv's place and gossip with his mom about Scriv. I mean, you you could. I just want to know all about Scriv when he was a baby. And she would tell you. And uh, that is why I am not spending my final evening there. Okay. Scriv, you get to enjoy a lovely evening with the the head of the Silverbloom family, Giles Silverbloom. He is a little shy of three and a half feet, short mutton chop beard. He is uh, missing his right ring finger on his hand. Uh, an old accident from a long time ago. I pay it no heed as I take his hand. Master Silverbloom, thank you for welcoming me into your home. Scrivener Whitecliff. Well, it's good to see ya. It's good to- and he just like, big pat on the arm. I appreciate it, but you're in my home. Please, sit, sit. No, eat, enjoy. He's there with his eldest son, Alad. Shake hands with Alad. He smiles. He has long, curled blonde hair, uh, piercing on his right eyebrow. Scriv, how long have you been in town for? Uh, only a couple of days, and I'm gonna be heading out shortly. But I thought I'd stop by, say hi. Yeah, of course, please. Like, we're so happy to have you all the time. Have you heard from Orlea at all? No, uh, I haven't. I just heard she was over in Ornthal? Yeah, she's been busy over there trying to make a name for herself. At this, Alon's sister, Bene, comes up. So, I heard that she is in the Ankalab Heights district. Last letter she wrote. Ankalab. What kind of name is that? I don't know. I don't understand Ornthal. This is why we're here. Yeah, fair enough. So, Scriv... Mm -hmm. How was your trip? How was the journey? It was interesting. I mean, where do I start? Usually the beginning is a very good place. With a slight wink. (sighs) Ha ha. It started off pretty simple. It was me and Belinda. I don't know if you met her. She worked with my dad some time ago doing paperwork, I think, for the government. Yeah, I've seen her around. We got recruited to escort someone from Amaran. And I mean, we already had to go there for stuff that my mom asked me to do. And we got paired up with these two characters. Can I say characters without being rude? Oh, please. Have you seen the people that tend to visit this place? Everybody's a character. (laughs) Well, they take the cake. One of them is this pale-skinned elf from Shadowfell. Uh, He's he's a death elf. He's a Shardarkai. 
then there's Valen, who's this big, tall guy. I, I don't know. He's huge, and he has shiny eyes sometimes, and he punches things really hard. He's a monk to some deity that I don't really remember. But we got paired up with them to go and meet a cleric over in Amaran, and fought undead, which was a thing. I mean, it got taken care of. The city guard managed to get everything together, and we fought them off, but it was just very different, not something that I'm used to seeing. After that, we were just on our way back. Well, sounds like uh, you had a moment where you went from the ditch to the duck pond, but got yourself out at least. I don't have butter behind my ears or anything for nothing. All in all, it's been a good trip. We're heading over to Orenthal now, and I'm looking forward to it. You gotta tell Orlay to write more to us. We don't hear from her enough, and she's gotta come visit. He kind of, like, gestures at you slightly. Okay, okay, I'll do it. The two of you, you're like two berries in the same bush. Yeah, I miss her, you know? Yeah, she definitely missed you. Once you started going off on all these uh, adventures, she realized it was probably about time. She really wanted to... Make a name for herself. Only way to do that is in a big city. Orenthal being the closest and one of the biggest. I hope she gets a patron. It'd be nice if she could find one, then she could settle down and just do her art. You and I both know there's no way that she's just going to settle down. That's fair. Some characters over in Orenthal, from what I hear. I mean, I haven't been, but they have all these new uh, machines that they've been building there. Walking people, or walking machine people? What? Yeah. No. This is news I hear from a lot of the, the tourists from out that way, but... Walking machine people? Like guards or servants or... I'm not completely sure. That's strange. All sorts of things out there. Makes things uh complicated. Not like here. Here is nice and simple. I mean, you say that, but I heard plenty of talk about guilds trying to move in. You know, your father won't let any of that happen. That's true. I missed you, Giles. And we missed you too, Scriv. Oh, how's that shield I made for you? Still doing its work. Keeping me safe. Good. Good to hear. Now you take good care of that. That is a Giles Silverbloom special. And I'll be sure to tell everyone who made it. You know, as much as trouble as you and Orlay used to get into, or if I'm being completely honest, as much trouble as Orlay used to get you into, <laughs> she's a good kid. I'll keep an eye out for her. But yes, overall, you have a... Very calm and lovely evening with the Silver Blooms. All right. So, Akiva, you get to spend time with Jane and Excellent. just talk all about Scriv. I'm assuming Vale and I are there as well, and I will sort of every so often nudge Akiva mentally if it seems like he might be oversharing. That's all about Jane. So, in general, we keep it light. We enjoy our time with them. We chit chat. I'm so sorry, Belinda. <laughs> I can do chit chat. Mm -hmm. Jack is there as well. So if you wanted to speak with Jack, I will take a chance to talk with Jack in private. Okay. After a bit, you and uh, Jack excuse yourselves and head into a side room. And I assume this is during the dessert portion of the meal where Akiva is like in full swing. Yes. Are you ready for whatever's coming next? Probably not, but there's no choice. It usually isn't. I've been having dreams or a dream. I don't know what that means. I mean, so I know I, I shared with you about the artifact that Zolas was carrying and that I'm now holding it, but I've now been experiencing this dream or this vision every night. Every night. Every night. I would assume then that it is not a dream if you are experiencing it every single night. Most likely it is something in relation to the artifact that you have. I assumed so, but I would prefer not to have this happen. But at the same time, it f seems like the vision is aware of me, if that makes any sense. Like it is aware that you exist? As if it is its own entity? Yes. From, if I recall what you were telling me about the artifact, essentially this is an essence of a demon lord, correct? That's my understanding so far. It's entirely possible then the artifact is aware of you. You think it has a sentience? I am not an expert by any means on magical artifacts of this nature, but it contains the actual essence of another being, a very powerful being in fact, and it contains a literal part of themselves, which most likely means that it is aware to a certain degree. Most likely, if this was a defensive measure by the Demon Lord, then it does not have a direct connection to him, at least not in so much as it would be able to share thoughts, memories, or what it is experiencing. Most likely, it is having that pressure upon your mind, and your mind may in response be experiencing this vision in order to compensate for that. 
I guess I just want to make sure that I'm only receiving, not sending. I do not understand how your abilities work. Most likely you have explained to me that there are ways that you can protect yourself. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's worked before and I was pretty confident that I could mask the aura of the artifact, but I just was concerned since it seems to be responding to me that I somehow might be connected to something. Well, there is a way to test it if you want to do so. Have someone else hold on to the artifact. But that would put it at risk if someone is actively searching for it. If you are able to disguise its aura, then... Maybe I should just wait until we get to Orenthal and I can take it to our mutual friend. That is probably for the best. I really didn't want to have to do that. I would offer to hold on to it, find a way to deal with it myself, but I don't think it is safe here. You've done a lot for Verpal. I don't want anything bad to happen to this place. Neither do I. I've done what is necessary. I always have. And I know you've done the same. I believe that you can figure out a way to deal with this. You just need to do so as soon as possible. I'll get the job done. I never thought you wouldn't. I'm going to hold up my end of the bargain. A few months before the party all met in Aspenbrook to begin this job, Belinda had arrived in Veripol and made plans to speak with Jack alone. Belinda, you find yourself in the Whitecliffe house while Scriv is busy at work and still recovering from a terrible injury. Jane, meanwhile, is currently attending to the excavation of the ruins of Silvercape. You're seated at a table across from Jack, as he says. So, Belinda, what brings you all the way out to Veripol? I don't... I'm assuming you got my recent letter, but... Yes, Jack, it's not like you to be obtuse. You obviously have a sense for why I'm here. I don't just show up places randomly. I'm assuming this has something to do with the fact that I'm moving forward with Scriv's training? Yes. I don't think I've been secretive about how I feel about it. And I think what would be best is if we talk it through, perhaps make some sort of arrangement. Right now, things have been delayed due to his recent injury, but hasn't the training done well for you? Wouldn't you want something similar for him? I'm not Scriv, and he is not who I am, not just because of upbringing. We're very different people, and I know I am who I am because of what I went through, and I... I think he deserves a chance to figure out who he is without that. He has spent most of his life here in Veripol, but there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And since you are no longer doing this work, I know that they would require some aid and Scriv could aid them in whatever jobs that they might require. Would you deny them such an asset? There are a lot of people doing a lot of good work. It's not essential that Scriv is the one who does it. No, but as I am a part of this group as well... They might expect me to push Scriv, at least to test him, to see if he is even capable of becoming an adept. You know he would meet their criteria. He has the skills. He picks things up quickly. You've done well by him. Thank you. But at the same time, you know everything about Scriv is shaped by his work and by his desire for your approval. So if you asked him to do this, he would do it without realizing what he was getting himself into. I would explain it to him, of course, but you're not wrong. He doesn't tend to always make a judgment call of himself. He tends to rely on whatever I think. Well, to be fair, you raised him to respect authority. Your authority. This is true. But you wouldn't come all this way if you didn't have a proposal for me instead, Belinda. You're right. We should just cut to the chase. I got out of it for my own personal reasons. I've been doing my own work, but, you know... We've talked about what's going on with Adar's absence and looking for answers, and while that's important, it's a long-term project, it seems, rather than something short-term like I had hoped. It's been several months, and there's still no response. Any of the clerics, the paladins, anyone that I've spoken to on it, they call out to him for guidance, for wisdom, for power, and there is silence, as far as I am aware. Yeah. I know you and I are on the same page, but I know also that it takes your time and effort to work with me on this search and gather information and keep people informed. So I, I would require that from you. Sharing information on whatever I learn on the search for Adar? Yes, and making sure it gets to the proper sources. Of course. But what I'm offering is to do the work. You would do the jobs that normally Scriv would be assigned? Yes, I would suggest that I take him with me. To see who he really is, to try and make up 
his own mind and get him to learn about the world more? Is that what you were looking for? Well, it seems like you wouldn't accept me just saying, don't worry, I'll take care of everything, because that just leaves Scriv completely out of the equation, and that's not who you have been preparing him to be all his life. But at the same time, it requires a level of commitment to particular ideologies that you and I understand that Scriv does not yet, and uh, perhaps a willingness to make tough choices, and I don't want him to have to do that, at least not alone. Not yet. So your proposal is you do the work that would normally be assigned to an adept, normally be assigned to Scriv, work that I could point you in the direction of. In exchange, I give you information on the search for Adar, as well as, of course, give it to the appropriate people who could actually do something about it. And you would then take Scriv on these different jobs and basically be a another voice so that he doesn't have to make difficult decisions on his own. Is my understanding correct? Essentially, I just think right now, if you say, Scriv, this is the life I have mapped out for you, he'll say absolutely, and he'll do it without a second thought. And before he knows it, he'll be years down the road and wondering how he became who he is. I don't know who he will become, but I'd like him to feel like he made the choices that determined who that person is, and not just following orders. Very well, but of course, I have some conditions. I expect nothing less from you. I agree. I will support whatever intel I can find on the search for Adar. Anything that I am able to gain from my contacts, I will send to you and to anyone who could actually do something about it. You will do the work that Scriv should be performing had he gone on the path that was originally planned. I mean, to be fair, I am overqualified, but... But you're no longer with them. No, and also let me clarify, I am not back in. No. And I'm not 100% certain that they would accept you right now should you ask to be back in. There would be a vetting process. This is essentially, I get the information on the different jobs. I give you the information so the jobs can be completed. Or you connect me with the people who will give me those details. You know, through the, the usual channels. I think, you know, there's the old cataclysm gambit. I haven't seen it used in ages, but it might be perfect for Scriv. He does quite have a fondness for that game. Yes, I think that might be a good idea. But as far as my conditions on this entire deal, he will not be enrolled as an adept, but he can never find out that we made this deal. I can't promise he'll never find out, but I can promise I will never tell him. The other major point that I want to make as this deal, if he does find out, you can't stop him should he choose to join. You know, I wouldn't stop him if it was his own choice. But at the same time, you can't force this on him. No, I cannot. He needs to learn to make his own decisions. He needs to learn more judgment upon his own part, rather than simply relying on mine. I want to make sure, though, that you are not having him trade, where he won't simply rely on your judgment instead. I trust your judgment, Belinda. But Yes, and I hope Scrib would trust my judgment, but I will do my best to use restraint and not be this, you know, crazy domineering person. Because you know me, I'm always inserting myself in other people's business. You have a way of getting people to do what you want them to do. Okay, that's fair. But at the same time, I don't care about a lot of things. There are only a few things I truly care about. On those things, you know I'm uncompromising. And this is why I'm even remotely agreeing to this deal in the first place. And you know, I'll keep my word. I expect the same. I will keep mine. Is he really okay? I don't want to ask him directly about what happened. I can tell it's a sensitive topic for him. I don't think he's ready to face whatever happened down there. Maybe going with you and journeying away from here will be good for him. You know, it'll probably be good for him to be away from so much emotional support, because I don't provide that very well. Between you and his mother, he's been, you know, really balanced in a sense. She fusses over him. And make sure that he is physically all right. I do worry, because this wound is lasting, it seems. It should have healed by now if it was anything normal. Well, maybe we'll find out what we can do about that as we go about. I'm sure we will be traveling on these various jobs. A lot more legwork than I'm sure you were used to. Yes, yes, let's rub it in that I had a desk job for years. So did you for a while. <laughs> I know. Eventually, though, I needed to stretch my legs a little bit more. Yes, yes, and become the, the paladin Whitecliff that everybody knows and respects and fears, let's admit it. I don't mind the fear slightly from those that should fear me. And he does have a slight smirk. 
See, I'm best forgotten. That's where I work best. That is what makes you all the more terrifying sometimes, Belinda. I don't think I've ever been described as terrifying before. Usually I'm described as, oh, I don't know, quiet, unobtrusive, maybe a little intimidating if someone happens to be on the wrong side of an argument. But to the very select few of us that know better. You're saying you would want to be on the wrong side of an argument or you'd want to be on the right side? I know what side of the argument to be on. Mm -hmm. You know, Jack, I don't think most friends make deals like this. We're not like most friends, though, are we, Belinda? No. Too much has happened for that. Far too much. Should I see him, or am I not here? Not today. I'll give you some money. Stay at an inn in town. I'll announce that you should be arriving in a day so that you can then talk to him. Okay. You know there is something special about him, right? You see, like, a very, like, distant look for a moment off him. Yes. I'm not completely certain as to what that is or why. I don't even know where to begin looking into that. I guess we'll see what unfolds on this journey. I suppose we will. I guess I will meet you in a day or so. I await your arrival in Tverapol, Belinda. You take care of yourself, Jack. And you as well. And we return to the present day, just as Belinda says. I'm going to hold up my end of the bargain. I know you will. You take care. You as well, Belinda. If there's ever anything else, let me know, and I will tell you when there's anything else I need of you. Of course. Take care of him. Always. I'll head back. You just come back as you just see Akiva just super animated, asking more and more like, And then when he was five, what did you do then? Literally asking for uh, Scribd's life story. Exactly. Okay, gotcha, his life story. All right, so I guess we enjoy the rest of our, our nice homey family dinner, which is weird for this party. And you weren't at uh, Death's Door this day either, so. No. Ooh. We're all rested and in good health. Okay, and eventually, Scriv, you do return home and are all able to rest for the evening. So, you all wake up the next morning. Again, you know, a full spread of food on the table. Jane just busily going about. Jack is here this morning, though, and he's just enjoying his breakfast. Akiva is actually with you. Is there anything else that you guys would like to do before you head out? I would like to have one last chat with my dad. Okay. So at some point, you are able to talk to him, get up, and and go to a separate room. So we're going to Orenthal to finish this thing with Zolas. Along the way, we're going to see what's going on with these whispered ones and then i guess we'll see what's going on from there it might be a while before i come back home i understand i appreciate you checking up on these things for me i thought about what you said about me being too dependent and all that i also thought about what you ended with that you lost your power and i want you to know that i still care for you dad that you were never to me you were never based on your power. You were just there doing things. The dad that I know was always at the front, uh, giving orders, giving direction, advice, and helping people however he could. You seem to have been doing all that now, but it's just that, well, after talking with Valen, it seems like losing that sort of power is really personal, and I appreciate you for telling me about it. Shannon, Scriv, it has been a very difficult year. The loss of the connection is by no means something that I take lightly. It is jarring, and it was extremely painful. I learned how to push aside how I feel quite some time ago in order to get the thing done. I have always tried to be on the front lines to give orders because I study, analyze, and then make a decision. I do love you, Shannon, and I only do want what is best for you, and I believe that you are quite old enough that you do not need to necessarily listen to my orders. I know. I've seen you grow up, and from what you have told me, and Belinda has told me of your adventures, you clearly think things through, and I am proud of you for that. I'm not just doing these things and checking these things out because they're orders. I'm doing them because I'm worried about what's going on out in the world. If losing your power, if losing power in general destabilized people like you and Valen and Zolus as much as it has, then there's probably a bunch of people who don't know how to deal with it properly. And groups like the Whispered Ones are just going to take advantage of that. And I came back home, and I saw Veripol, and it was still the glitzy, kitschy town that I left, but it was home. 
And if the Vremer Empire falls because the Whispered Ones take advantage of whatever's going on with the gods, then I'd lose home. I'd lose this sort of thing everywhere else. All the work that we did while I was growing up will be gone. Then it's very simple. We don't let that happen. No, we won't. I will continue to do what I can here in order to provide information and deal with things that I am able to. I will forward any information that I can back home, and I'll stay in touch. And I will let you know if there's anything that I feel that you may want to check out on your journeys. Thanks, Dad. And he gives you a hug. Before you go, I know you in many ways see Belinda as my friend. And you have worked together for quite some time, but she knows what she's doing. Trust her judgment. Consult her if you're ever uncertain on a decision. She's way too paranoid. I was talking to this nice old lady on the road, and she just thought that she was just way too healthy, had too much vitality. It was just a nice older what woman. What was her name? It was just by something or other. By Gosto. I see. Listen to Belinda. Trust her judgment. Trust me on this. She sees things in a way that you and I do not. All right. And be very careful if you are to see that old woman again. Okay. Dad, I break the hug. What am I missing here? Hopefully nothing. Okay. Belinda says that this old woman had a lot more vitality than she should. You have already experienced betrayal once. Be careful of who you trust, even if someone seemingly is sweet and innocent. Okay. That's a fair enough rule to live by. I just don't want to be paranoid like Belinda. Sometimes paranoia can be beneficial. It's not paranoia if you're right. And she's usually right. Yeah. I'll keep an eye out. And keep in touch. Yeah, I have to send letters anyway. I'd stop by the Scribner's office for the last set of templates that I need to write up. All right. Take care, son. Love you, Dad. I love you, too. So, jumping over to the rest of the party. Akiva, I know you wanted to pull Valen aside and talk to him. So, how are you doing? I'm going to be all right. Good. Because I know, I know it wasn't even just you. Like, that was... I never felt that anger before. Well, we haven't been through a ton that would really make you that angry since you've gotten to the Prime and discovered the full palette of emotions, so no one can really blame you. Yeah. Hey, I promised you learning experiences, right? This is true. I'm glad you're doing a bit okay, because I, I haven't checked up on you in a little bit, especially since all these god bombs see, seem to be dropping. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, in the same token, how are, how are you actually doing? You had the entire actually leaving for a while thing and uh yeah so obviously i didn't just go to get this symbol i had a conversation with umbra and i'll get into it a bit more once we're on the road but i mean it was a lot longer than it had been before and he dropped a couple bombs so hey we're all having a good time right yeah <laughs> oh oh man this has been a really great diversion from our normal trip I will say, though, I feel like we've really picked up two really good people. I gotta say, I've been continually impressed by them. Same. Which, on the one hand, I'm glad for, but on the other hand, I am a little bit nervous. The person who recruited us for this job obviously recruited them, and one wonders why exactly we were all put together. Because clearly, these were not just some renta thugs sent to, you know, pick someone up and bring them back to town. Yeah. There's more going on with, um... Shannon. Shannon. I know, right? Okay, no, I gotta... I'm not making fun of him. I'm not, it's just I didn't peg it. I just... I haven't heard someone named Shannon in a long time. I was a child. I mean, I don't mind it, it's just... I didn't even think to think that Scriv wasn't his real name. It is an archaic name for a guy. I like it, though. It fits. I can see why he might have gone with Scriv. It's catchy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm gonna keep that in the back pocket. Yeah. Now, they... Those two are competent. Very. I'm a little bit scared still of Belinda. Sometimes, like, we come across things and I just get the sense that she is picking things apart on levels that I just don't even see. And I'm not sure where to go with that. I definitely see that, too. I can tell there's definitely more to her than she's telling us. But I trust her a lot. And I, I dare say the two of them have become, I, I would call them, very close friends. How many friends do you have? There's obviously you. Okay. No, I do think they're trustworthy. I think Belinda would have extricated herself a long time ago if she weren't invested in what we're doing. And I frankly think Scriv is a terrible liar. I think he might be worse than me, which is saying something. I think you could lie if you wanted to. You're just too good a guy. You've got it in you. You're a performer. You can tell entertaining lies. I didn't think about it like that. That's not the point. I think we can trust them. 
Yeah, definitely. I'm a bit nervous about getting back to Orenthal. There's a lot riding on all of this, and we're supposed to meet up with this Elizabeth character, and... Yeah, from what you guys tell me, a lot of stuff is gonna happen here, and it seems like it's a really big city. Oh yeah, it's huge. Way bigger than Amaron. That was already really big. I gave it a lot of, uh, cruft on the walk-in. I don't care for the politics of the town in general, it's a very self-important place. But that aside, it is a marvel, and I think you'll have a great time. There's an endless amount of things to do there. If it weren't for the fact that the culture around some of the temples there was not particularly friendly to an upstart religion back in the day, I would probably have spent more time there. But I, I have to admit, I have a bit of a bias. Speaking of which, do you think there's a temple to Nezalem? Uh, at least there was temples to everyone. There's It's the center of the kingdom and therefore the center of religious practice. A lot of people have very conflicted feelings about your god, being that his domain does represent the end of all that they know. You people on the material plane have such hang-ups about death. A lot of people. Yes. I'm just saying that in the temple district, there are people who are more broadly accepting of the nature of reality and that some tasks and some domains are not necessarily pretty or popular, but they're essential. So I dare say you'll find followers of your god in Orenthal. It'll be interesting to see what the worshippers on the material plane of Nezlum look like. Yeah, no, I think you'll have a good time. I know they, they might have strong-armed you out of building a temple, but maybe one day we can build a temple to your god. I still hold the belief that she's still around. Yeah, it's not a huge concern. I mean, I ended up eventually falling in with a good group of worshippers of Karis and... Yeah, but I think, at the very least, it'll be nice to have something for her. Concerns for down the road. For right now, I should get sleep. You, I guess, um, can do you. I'll go sleep as well. And we'll get set out bright and early in the morning. Yeah. Okay. So, Scriv returns to the table as you guys are finishing up. Unless there's anything else, I assume you are heading over to go collect the fake crystal. Yes. The total not forgery. Yes, and we also collected the letter, I hope, that they sent. You guys had it, yeah. Yeah, so we have transcribed a copy, and we are going to include the original with the artifact in a package. Okay. The fake crystal, they would have charged you a silver for, just so you're aware. Mm -hmm. And then they have it. There's a, a small crack along the side of it, kind of how you indicated, in order to make it seem like if it did have power, it is gone now. And unless there is anything else... Is there anything we need to do to assess how convincing it is, or...? You showed him the, the shard, or, like, described exactly how that would look. So essentially, he, with that, just expanded it to the dimensions that you wanted, and created something that looks like it could have fit in the amulet, in the exact spot. We didn't find out how Faithfulness was going to receive payment, did we? No. Okay. I would assume it might be back at the drop site. Because if she doesn't collect her money, that would be weird. Yep, you're still in town if you wanted to do anything else. Yeah, I'm going to go back and talk to Faithfulness. If Jack didn't know, then we need to find out that piece. Okay. Is anyone else going to the jail? I would say Akiva should go to the jail. All right. Akiva, you can come with, and I will go see if we can get the information we need from Faithfulness, because if she doesn't collect her payment, that would be a bit of a flaw in our plan for them to not track back to Veripol. So I guess we'll head on over to the jail. Okay, so you arrive at the jail. Go ahead and roll a, a persuasion check for me to get in. They let Jack in and they let Scriv in because of his relationship to Jack, but they don't necessarily know you. Okay. Eight. Do you have any sort of proof that's okay with Paladin Whitecliff that you could see his prisoner? Okay, Tony, I will show them my other papers. Ah, um, my apologies, ma'am. Uh, please, go ahead. Thank you. Yo, what was that? Don't worry about it. So, you are escorted to the cell where you find faithfulness just hands chained behind her back hey buddy ah hello death elf hey why are you here how are you supposed to collect your payment for the job why should i tell you i'm not interested in playing games but i'll make a deal with you you seem like someone who is in a bad position things could get better they could get worse interested i'm sure if we talk to paladin whitecliff we could offer you certain comforts go on what do you want? Cards on the table. You now know what we want. I want to go. That's a non-negotiable. But there's no reason your stay here has to be unpleasant. What are you offering? We could come bring you things. Certain luxuries. How about just an assurance you don't die in here? Because right now you don't have that. My death could be repurposed. 
I'm not afraid of death. No, but I'm sure it wouldn't endear you to your mission if you failed. Go ahead and roll an intimidation with advantage. 22. I'd rather not have my arms constantly chained behind my back and some decent meals every so often. Different restraints, different food. I think that's doable. So they're supposed to leave a small bag a couple miles southwest of the cave. I'm supposed to go get it after dropping off whatever I found. Does this require that they verify what you found or is the payment not contingent upon that? This payment's not contingent upon it. This is just to, just to do the job. It was to help for to pay for the other mercenaries. Whatever they found, I was to return a ten day later to receive additional instructions or payment. Tony, I'd like to use my ability to ask her if what she has told me is true. So you put some pressure on her and she just, why would I lie to you? I don't know you. So she is not aware that you did that, correct? No. So she did save? Yes, she saved. All right. I'll hold up my end of the bargain. If I find out you lied to us, then the deal is off. I'm not going anywhere. No, you're not. Anything you want to add, Akiva? Have a lovely day. Death Elf, your sword. Yes? Where did you get it? You don't need to answer that. Yeah, I didn't figure you needed to know. Why do you care? I have heard rumor of an onyx black blade. Okay. One that seems to suck the very light from a room. And what does this rumor say? Where did you get it? I just acquired it. I believe he simply picked it up. You know, these things happen. You get something here and there. Interesting. I think we'll be going now. Bye bye She just kind of, like, turns her head away from you. And walk away. Okay. You guys have the crystal. You spoke with faithfulness. Is there anything else? Are we hitting the road? We're hitting the road again. All right. So you guys are heading out. As you initially are leaving the caverns of Veripol, it is pouring rain. <sighs> you guys head out, and for the first day, it is just pouring rain. You start to make your way along the roads. You eventually find a secluded area that you could pull off the side of the road and start to make camp. Putting to the side, Valen, I know, is off getting ready to cook something. Akiva is preparing the illusory camp to throw any potential bandits off your scent. And Zolus is taking care of the rest of camp. No, he's day drinking, isn't he? <laughs> Zolus is just sitting around. You see, he is, he is praying a little bit, but he's kind of just around. He goes by uh, Akiva and kind of just asks some questions on, like, his magic and stuff like that in general. Then I will unpack the card and start setting up tents, I suppose. Okay. And Belinda, what are you up to? I'm helping. I mean, we've definitely made camp together and broken down before, so I will just assist, you know, to also be helpful every so often. I appreciate it. We've really gotten used to this entire camp setting up thing. I mean, we've been on the road, except for those brief visits in town for a while now. Yeah, I didn't really think I would get used to it, honestly. I mean, I've traveled before, but that was usually with a caravan. We had carts, we could just have impromptu tents that were tied to the caravan. This is really just roughing it. Kind of like it. Do you like it better than being in Veripol? Had you asked me a couple of months ago, I would have said no, that I missed home. But now that it's fresh, I think I kind of miss... I, I missed being on the road. Not the hard floor or the hard tack. I missed having an actual meal. Well, yeah, we definitely enjoy the creature comforts in Veripol. It's been a while. But I know, there's some social obligations that we've been free of, right? Yeah. I mean, had you told me months ago that we would be dealing with demons and everything else? I wouldn't have believed you. I will say, this is not the job I signed up for. We really should be getting more money if this was the job all along. I felt bad for, you know, you putting the pressure on that government official, but now? Yeah, I agree. I don't think we were paid nearly enough. It did seem like there was more to this job than met the eye, and there's still, I'm sure, is more we're gonna find out when we get to Orenthal, but honestly, I wonder if we're ready for this. Whatever this is, I just am not sure, which is weird for me. Yeah. Like, for as much as I said that you were kind of paranoid and that I didn't believe you, you've been on the money every time. And yeah, I mean, even with uh, Bai, I don't know what's going on there, but Dad was freaked out, so you must have been on to something. I'm sure he was freaked out in a quiet, scary way that only Jack can really do. Well, I mean, a raised eyebrow says a thousand words when it comes to Dad. So you guys had a talk? It was less of a talk and more of a lecture. You know, I have the greatest respect for him, but he's not always right about everything and everyone. Just be honest with me. Do I just depend on other people too much? 
I guess I would say on the flip side, you could be someone who doesn't want to rely on other people at all, and then people think you're paranoid and don't know how to trust you. So maybe I'm not the right person to give advice. But I would say you probably care too much what certain people think of you. I mean... Look at all the things that he's done. I mean, half the Vremer expansion wouldn't be what it was if it wasn't for Dad. Going out, helping people, setting up camps and cities and towns, governments, people coming together for a purpose. I mean, is it so wrong to want to try and emulate that? No, definitely not. I mean, if you talk about results, there's really no one quite like Jack Whitecliffe. But at the same time, results-driven thinking is kind of dangerous, you know? If you only think about the outcomes. You don't really think about what it takes to get there. Speaking from experience? Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe a time or two. But honestly, I think you should listen to your, your father and respect him as I do. But, you know, don't be afraid to forge your own path, find your own way to solve problems. And don't feel like you have to be shut off from everything. Because I know that's his solution to a lot of problems. Yeah. You still get to be yourself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, still can't beat him in Cataclysm, but I know there are other things I do better than he does. Well, I don't know many people who could beat him in Cataclysm. He practically invented the game. Don't you start with that. I still refuse to believe that rumor. I've never seen any proof to the contrary, and it does add to his mystique, but I don't know. I kind of like to believe it could be true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to keep secrets from the people I really trust, and that includes you, that includes Jack. Would you be able to keep a secret from him? From Dad? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I know, sorry, I didn't give any context, but I don't like to put people in uncomfortable positions like that. I know I can trust myself to keep a secret when I need to. I talked to Akiva a bit before we left Veripol, mm -hmm. and we know he has this patron. Yeah, Umbra. Yeah, well, it's worse than we thought. What do you mean by worse? So you know how I'm often considered paranoid, and in maybe my worst case scenario, Akiva is like a living, breathing, walking sensor for some sort of all-powerful, perhaps sinister force or deity. Like, that would be the worst case scenario. I mean, Death Elf, their, their entire race is built to witness something. Well, what if in this worst case scenario, it's someone who's probably in opposition to the god of death and who's gaining power? Just hypothetically speaking. The obvious question would be evidence. I believe you, I believe your instincts, especially with your- and I kind of waggle my fingers around my brain in a vaguely <laughs> psychic motion, <laughs> especially with all that, but- Akiva was really honest with me and told me, based on his experience, he's pretty confident that Umbra is able to use him and to some extent control him or control his memory, to the point where he had a memory blocked which I accessed. And Umbra knew I was going to do that. Okay, then. That's... I wanted to tell you in Veripol, and I wanted to tell Jack, because I trust his advice, but I also know he would not abide such a risk lightly. So, somebody opposed to the god of death, who has a sensor, an eye, a witness, that is in contact with Zolus, who has a very important message for the people in Orenthal. Yeah, who is aware of who we are, what we're doing, and my powers, which can only have come from experience being connected to Akiva, hardly anyone else knows. And they also know about the amulet and the fact that we're pursuing some kind of gem that we're on our way to Solana after Orenthal. Yes, and I, I do honestly believe that Akiva is genuinely scared and... He wants to do good. He doesn't want this, I don't think. He doesn't know what to do. He's not trying to betray us. I don't think Jack would care about Akiva's intentions. I think he would... Kill Akiva? Possibly. I mean, I don't know for sure he wouldn't, and I didn't want to take the risk. Well, we can turn this into a good thing. Which is? Well, if we know that somebody's listening in, then we can give them information and then plan around the fact that they know. True. I do have some experience with misinformation. As a clerk? You know, I did government work. It's all a lot of nonsense and crosstalk regularly, even in just day-to-day -day signing of paperwork. Oh, office politics. I get that. Yeah, you really missed out. You could have found your calling. No, I had enough with Bistan, thanks a lot. I will say most of the people I worked with were much more competent than Bistan. They at least did show up. He's good at his job when he's around, but is there any way that we can 
prepare for this? Like, if he has some sort of mental whammy going on, can I get inured to it? If Valen and I are fighting, and he hits me on the head with a quarterstaff, I will take the hit, I will get a little tougher, and I'll learn how to dodge the hit. But I'm not exactly sure how you defend from ageless evil trying to overwrite your personality or memories or whatever. Yeah, that's fair. And obviously I wasn't prepared for this enough because he was able to know that I was going to engage with Akiva's memory and open myself up to some sort of interaction. But I know I have the ability to communicate telepathically. I think it might be good practice for you to learn how to refuse that communication. That would be good. So what, you're gonna just think loud, violent thoughts towards me? It doesn't have to be violent, just... I saw what you did to that one bandit guy. I don't know what you did, but it looked violent. Okay, well, that might have been violent, but the thoughts weren't violent, just the reaction. It's more about the intensity, I guess I would say. I It's something I'm still learning and figuring out, but I think this will be good practice for both of us. Okay, then after dinners, after my game with Akiva, then I guess an hour of training that way, and then we can just talk and yeah. Yeah, I think that'll be good. Yeah, th thanks for the talk. It had been a while since we'd had a one-on-one, -on -one and I know I've been busy trying to train, and especially with my side getting better, I wanted to get back to proper fighting form. Well, and you know, heart-to-hearts don't come naturally to me, so <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> and I appreciate it. All right, so you go to rest on the evening of the first day out from Veripol, and we're going to fast-track this a little bit, but the following two days wind up actually being very clear and... Very smooth and uneventful trip overall as you are heading along. You occasionally have some carts kind of passing by you the opposite direction, um, but overall it's pretty uneventful. So for the sake of simplicity, you guys are uh, know that the cave is coming up. It's a little bit off the side of the road. What are your plans? I'm putting a psionic sensor on our package. I was kind of thinking I would just walk up to the cave with my cloak on and just place the package and walk away. It really does seem to be a good idea. Maybe the rest of us can try to stealth into positions where we can back you up if someone collapses on you. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, we'll stealth and I'll just hide us in an image of a bush. Okay, so you guys are just approaching the cave. Tony, I think Faithless was probably comparable in size to Belinda. Yes. Okay, I was just going to ask Scriv if he could help me create the facsimile of, like, the shape of horns under my hood. Oh, yeah. Just so I have the right silhouette. That's all I think we need. Yeah. Uh, would you like for me to roll disguise check? Yes, please. That's a crit. So, yeah, even up close, there's a moment where Belinda doesn't look like a half-elf. Perfect. Okay, and I've got my cloak, Tony, which I believe I can change its appearance. You can. And I know what she was wearing. You do. It was more robe-like, but yes. Then I will have it match the texture of the robe and the color. Okay. It's my one magic item. Fancy cloak. <laughs> Actually, what I can do in the meantime, Lazarus, circle overhead. Scout. Just kind of look to see if you can see anybody. Before you get there? Yeah. Before and during. Roll a perception check. 18. Okay, so scanning the area, you at one point, Akiva, as you're kind of coming up to the cave, it's mid-afternoon, you see a kind of cloaked figure head towards it before you guys get there and go into the cave, but has not left by the time you guys arrive. Oh. I will let everybody know that. Okay, that there's someone currently in the cave. Yeah. I cannot pretend to be a tiefling in person. So it only be if whoever is picking up this package has not met her, or if this is someone completely unrelated. Do we know anything about this cave? I mean, this is just a, a pretty small cave. Okay, it's pretty shallow. It's There's nothing yeah. really. Okay. It's just like a little shelter, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's got some like vines and stuff growing around the back and everything, but... Okay. So I would kind of like to know who's in the cave. It could be someone completely unrelated. We don't want to blow through our plan necessarily, but sorry, question to the DM. Is this about the time when we we knew we were supposed to deliver it or it was unclear that they're just going to check regularly? Since it took a couple days to travel to the cave, most likely it would be checked either today at the earliest or over the next several days. Okay. So there's someone in the cave. We've got a couple options. I can just go and find out who it is and then we deal with the fallout, but we might compromise our current plan, which is the more subtle approach. So we could just wait and drop off the package later and see when that person leaves. I mean, you're not expecting to talk to anyone. It's going to be a dead drop. So yeah, go in, drop off the package as expected. And if they engage you, then try as best you can because it's a dark cave. I'll just pretend to be a psychotic tiefling. That's the spirit. 
My parents would be so proud. <laughs> Scriff, go with her. She hired people in town. She hired at least one person from Veripol to be her subject matter expert to get in there and get the information, even answer questions about what the crystal was and what it might have fit into. And more importantly, you can help her. Just in case. That is a fair point. Okay, I will light a torch and I will carry it in. I would like to make sure that the shadowing from the torch make it very difficult to tell what Belinda's appearance is under the hood. Okay, appreciate that. And I guess Akiva and Valen? We'll be on the side, waiting. When this figure leaves, we can send you a message if we need you to follow them, because we have the earrings. Okay. Yeah, we'll be a respectful distance away, hiding behind some coverage. Yeah, and hiding the cart. Yeah. All right, let's go. So we go, Tony. Okay. So you walk up to the cave, which is very quiet as you approach the cave, and you kind of come up. It's pretty small, maybe about... 20 feet in before you see the wall and there is no one there okay just gonna drop the crystal in the is there an alcove or something we were supposed to leave it in essentially there's like a little small alcove by the entrance that you could kind of tuck it around if you wanted all right i will leave it there look around this wasn't where we were getting payment right it's nearby all right let's go get paid Okay. As you are leaving, Scriv, you hear uh, kind of a muffled scream. From where? Behind you, back in the cave. I will stop. Did you hear that? No. I heard a scream. I would like to go inside and check again, but it may blow our cover. Normal people respond to screams. Let's go. Okay. I will go inside, and I would like to look at- Okay. Roll me one investigation check with advantage. I'll do my, um, my earring. Just say we heard a scream. Hold on. 16. Okay. So, looking up- you notice towards the top of the cavern, there seems to be, like, as you're studying it, your hand kind of pushes aside what looked like solid stone and has a small opening above it. There's an opening into the cavern wall. How high is it? Eight feet up. Okay. Just look at the window. I think we need to find out. I'm going in. Is our package still there? Did you leave it at the entrance? I left it at the entrance. It's still there. Okay. I'm climbing into the hole. Can I help? You help boost him up? Yeah, boost. Okay. I'll put the torch out, because there's no way I'm keeping a torch that close to my face while I'm crawling in a tunnel. I pull Gertis out. Okay. The tunnel extends about 15 feet before you see a, a very clear opening that drops you down into the cavern below. I'll take out a script, shake it, say now, and drop a single one. Okay. Lights up. It drops in, and with your passive, you are able to get a glimpse of a motionless body with fresh blood around it. And that is where we're going to leave this episode for today. Thank you all for listening. Please share this with your friends and follow us on Twitter at Rules is Written, or check out our website, dndraw.com, and feel free to email any questions to me at dm at dndraw.com. Also subscribe and leave us a review or comment anywhere podcasts are found, and please check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash dndraw. And I hope to see you next time in the world of Ostia.